I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today um, for our highly anticipated uh, North Carolina Tomato Club History and Transcribeathon event. We're so excited to be able to do this today. I am Virginia Ferris, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Program Librarian for Special Collections at NC State University's libraries. Um, I want to start our event just with a big thank you to everyone who has helped organize this event, including all of our speakers who will meet in a, a moment and my amazing colleagues in the libraries who have done so much work to help make this possible today. Um, so our event today is highlighting a fascinating and wonderful collection of handwritten booklets created by young girls in North Carolina um, over a century ago who were part of tomato clubs formed by Jane McKimmon. We'll learn all about the history of these clubs and the legacy that they are a part of in just a minute. But um, first, just a note to mention that um, these booklets are part of um, a collection held at the North Carolina State Archives in downtown Raleigh. They're not a part of the Special Collections uh, Research Center at NC State, but they are housed at the State Archives. Um, this is the collection finding aid here, the collection number as well. Um, we have links to how to access this that I'll, I'll reference in just a moment. Um, several years ago, our department, the Special Collections Research Center, partnered with the State Archives to digitize these booklets um, as part of the Jane McKimmon papers, and they're now openly available through our rare and unique collections site, digital collections site. Um, so I encourage you to explore the finding aid for the McKimmon papers here um, at the State Archives to learn more about what else is in this rich collection, um, including letters, scrapbooks, menus, reports, and much more. Um, and you can explore the digitized Tomato Club booklets through our um, Special Collections Rare and Unique Digital Collections site, um, which makes these booklets accessible for researchers online. So anyone, anywhere, anytime, open to the public can access them on our website. Um, so links to uh, the finding aid at the State Archives and to the digitized booklets at NC State are available at the link on the screen here, go.ncsu.edu. Um, slash forward slash NC State transcribes. Um, it has lots of resources, readings, books, um, even a, an amazing uh, recipe for uh, green tomato uh, crumb cake. Uh, lots of interesting stuff uh, you're welcome to take a look at and support documentation for the transcribeathon happening later um, um, after one o'clock. So um, in that vein, we have a, a special kind of structure to the event today. Um, there are two parts. First, we'll have a discussion of the history of the Tomato Clubs Extension and 4-H in North Carolina with four special guests um, who I'll introduce in just a moment. And then at one o'clock, we'll take a five-minute break um, and then return for our Transcribeathon. Um, the Transcribeathon portion of the day uh, from about 1.05 to 3 p.m. is um, optional. You don't have to stay for three hours, but we uh, would love to see you if you're interested in sticking around. Um, at that stage, several of my colleagues here at NC State and I will be here to help you get oriented and start transcribing the handwritten booklets if you choose to stick around, which um, we, we hope you will. Um, but if you can't, absolutely no problem. We uh, encourage you to take a look at that Go link um, that's been shared with you uh, as a registrant um, and that we just saw on the page before. You're welcome to transcribe at any point in the future after the event today and the instructions at that link will help you get started. Here's a how-to video and lots of step-by-step -step instructions you can follow. Um, so before we get started, um, I'd like to share some general information. Um, the libraries and its partners are working to ensure that our programs are welcoming and affirming for everyone involved. Um, that means that everyone from event organizers to attendees has an important role to play in contributing to a respectful and positive environment. So we ask you to reflect on the way you pose comments and questions in the chat to ensure they do not harm other participants. When we speak, the impact of our words is just as important as our intent. So today we ask um, that you encourage and engage in this program with exploration and curiosity um, while being kind and intentional with your words for the sake of our community. 
Um, so we're going to get started now with our history discussion. Um, and I'd like to uh, first introduce our four speakers today. Um, we have first up Todd Kosmerick, the interim associate head and university archivist um, with the Special Collections Research Center here at NC State University Libraries. Um, after Todd, we'll hear from Netta Cox who is the Agricultural Liaison, Librarian, and Associate Professor at North Carolina A&T State University. Then we'll hear from Jim Clark, uh, Professor Emeritus of English at NC State and author of the book, Clover All Over, North Carolina's First 4-H Century. And then finally, we'll hear from Elizabeth Englehart, Senior Associate Dean for Fine Arts and Humanities at UNC Chapel Hill and author of the article, Canning Tomatoes, Growing Better and More Perfect Women, The Girls Tomato Club Movement, which really is the um, inspiration for my interest in these booklets and um, for a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. So after we hear from each of our speakers, we will respond to questions from the audience. So please feel free to type in any questions you have into the chat as we go, and uh, the, the hosts will share some of those questions later on. So with that said, um, I will now pass the mic to Todd to get us started um, with, with his first set of remarks. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Virginia. Um, again, I'm Todd Kosmerick, and I'm speaking today in my role as university archivist at North Carolina State University. And I work with uh, Virginia in the Special Collections Research Center of the DHL Library. So today, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of historical context of, of um, how the tomato clubs came to be and kind of what the, what the um, environment was like in which they came to be over 100 years ago. Um, and so I'm going to spend 10 minutes giving you a lot of dates and facts. Um, and uh, you probably won't retain all that, but hopefully some of it will, will be helpful to you. Uh, Virginia, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, going back a little bit before the creation of the tomato clubs, um, I wanted to talk about this movement in the late 19th century um, farm demonstration. And so the idea um, behind this was that experts would go out and show farmers um, either new agricultural techniques um, or, you know, um, new, new kinds of crops or new varieties of crops um, to Im improve uh, agriculture in the United States. Um, and many of these experts were coming from uh, new programs that were being developed at the universities across the country. Um, there was a new interest in, in the United States and really, um, you know, in Europe too and, and uh, throughout West, the West um, about, um, you know, using science and evidence-based evidence approach to uh, learn more about how we could grow better um, or raise um, better agricultural products. Um, this, uh, this movement was kind of haphazardly financed, um, but then starting in 1906, uh, an entity called the General Education Board um, began to more systematically finance demonstration work in the American South. Um, I believe the General Education Board uh, eventually grew into the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. So there's these demonstrations that are happening on farms across the country, mostly targeted towards um, men um, and initially towards white men. Uh, but in 1907, the, there was the idea to, well, maybe we should show um, some boys some of these techniques and we could e educate an entire generation and kind of transform agricultural practices that way. Um, so that first happened in Mississippi in 1907. And I believe that that is um, the, the, the club that was formed um, at a community in Mississippi. I believe that's kind of considered to be the beginnings of 4-H in the United States. Um, and so it's only just a couple years later that the first uh, club for white boys is formed in North Carolina. And a lot of these early clubs for boys um, had a kind of project or emphasis. So there were corn clubs, the, the boys learned um, 
how to grow corn or how to grow corn better than they may have known already. Um, there were also pig clubs and bee clubs and, and all kinds of things like that. Next slide, please. And so just a few years later um, in South Carolina, there was a idea, well, you know, if we're doing this for boys, why don't we do this for girls too? And so the first tomato club was um, established in South Carolina where girls um, learned how to grow tomatoes or how to grow tomatoes better than they had known before. And then also they learned how to can those tomatoes. And so just a year after this, um, that kind of idea of having a girls tomato club moves to North Carolina too. And um, it was originally called Home Demonstration. And um, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is, is gonna be about home demonstration in North Carolina. Next slide, please. In order to talk about home demonstration in North Carolina, I have to tell you a little bit about Jane McKimmon because she um, was the per person that founded um, this movement, this organization in North Carolina. Um, she was hired in 1911 specifically to establish tomato clubs. And she um, initially did that herself um, and then very quickly began hiring um, other women to serve as agents to you know, go out to um, communities all across the state and organize girls into these tomato clubs. Um, what's also interesting about Jane McKimmon is that um, she's one of the first women to um, graduate, um, to get an undergraduate degree at NC State University. Um, and I have the date there. And, and she, um, she was uh, um, part of the extension service um, until she retired in 1937. But then she wrote a book called When We're Green, We Grow. And in that, she talks about the early development of home demonstration and the beginning of the tomato clubs in North Carolina. Um, and if you are familiar with the NC State campus, the McKimmon Center on campus is named for her. Next slide, please. So a few years after um, these uh, tomato clubs and corn clubs are coming into existence and, you know, after this farm demonstration movement has um, been kind of going across the country, um, the U.S. Congress passes the Smith-Lever Act. And this act kind of formalized all this work and provided federal funding for it um, across, all across the country. So formally organized the extension services in all the states. It based those extension services in the land grant universities of each state. And in North Carolina, we have two land grant universities, NC and State University and NC State University. Um, the extension service uh, really formed a partnership between the states, between the US Department of Agriculture. And then um, in many of the counties in the states, there were um, agents uh, placed there. And so there's this kind of multi-level um, web of, of um, you know, kind of uh, dissemination of agricultural information going on across the country. So initially, um, the Extension Service um, encompassed the farm demonstration, the boys clubs, um, which were the corn clubs, the bee clubs, the pig clubs, etc. And then the home demonstration, which initially were the tomato clubs for girls. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to um, do a little detour here and talk about the African American legacy and extension. Um, because up till now, what I've been talking about has um, have been programs that were mostly um, targeted to a white audience. Um, but this movement spread to African American communities too, um, beginning in 1914. Um, and in 1915, um, at NCANT, um, John Ray was hired as the first African American extension agent there. Um, 
So, um, you know, there's very early development going on over at ANT2. Next slide, please. Um, just quickly um, throwing out some names of some important people uh, in extension um, uh, during those early years. Um, John Mitchell, um, who is, um, I'm sorry, he's, um, he's kind of covered up on my screen. <laughs> he's over on the right. <laughs> Ari Jones is on the left. Um, not pictured is S.B. Simmons, who actually was not, um, I, I believe he was not in the extension service, but he was working at um, ANT simultaneous to the, to the early development of extension. And Simmons was involved in um, early agricultural vocation education and um, was a very um, uh, important member in the founding of the New Farmers of America organization. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna go back to um, the early days of home demonstration. So again, uh, they began as tomato clubs for girls, um, but in no time, the mothers of those girls were like, well, hey, you know, our daughters are learning some really important stuff here. Why don't we form some clubs and learn it too? Um, so clubs for white women began in 1913. And then just a few years later, um, the United States became involved in World War I. And home demonstration became an important uh, um, tool, I guess you could use, um, for the United States to um, develop a food conservation um, organization. Uh, um, you know, to kind of save food so that we could send more of the food overseas to feed our troops who were fighting in Europe, as well as to feed the populations of our allied countries in Europe. And Jane McKimmon um, was actually put in charge by, the, I believe, the governor of the food conservation movement in North Carolina. Um, also, because of the war, um, home demonstration received extra funding to expand the program into African American communities. So then African American women and girls um, would also learn um, some of these techniques uh, and, you know, originally um, canning and other food preservation techniques, but um, quickly expanding beyond that. And then just as an interesting aside, um, in the fall of 1918, the Spanish flu epidemic um, kind of uh, overwhelms the United States. And the home, the women who were involved in home demonstration really played an important role um, during that pandemic. Um, they uh, set up soup kitchens in, in many communities in North Carolina to help feed the sick. And in some instances, um, some of the women in home demonstration nursed the sick during that pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, continuing into the 1920s, um, home demonstration kind of expands. Um, you know, it becomes a, a, a larger um, organization. There's all, you know, there's more clubs in local communities and they kind of band together into a federation and then, um, uh, there's this idea of, of holding curb markets where um, women in the clubs uh, could sell some of the produce they've grown, could sell some of the things they canned, and eventually I think they were also um, selling handicrafts at, um, that they made. Um, uh, and so, you know, this was a mechanism where they could, um, you know, really earn some, some money outside of the home. Uh, throughout the 20s and into the 30s, um, uh, there's a broad home economics emphasis and um, a lot of um, information is, is being provided and training provided on nutrition, on making clothes, on repairing furniture even, on making mattresses, um, which is interesting, and um, even grooming. Uh, okay, Virginia is telling me I'm at 10 minutes. <laughs> Next slide, please, <laughs> which I will go uh, very quickly. Those are, um, those are just some of the um, names of some of the women who were involved in the, um, in the early days of home demonstration. Uh, I won't go into what they 
did. Um, I'll just go on to the next slide. <laughs> um, so uh, you may remember uh, I said um, uh, home demonstration uh, was originally aimed at girls. It expanded to women. Well, in the 1920s, um, all those boys clubs and all those girls clubs were kind of, you know, at least in North Carolina, um, while they had sort of been called 4-H organizations in the 1910s, it was really in the 1920s that they were all kind of really brought under the 4-H banner. And so, um, uh, from like about 1926 onward, when you're talking about youth programs, you're talking about 4-H. And if you're still talking about home demonstration in the late 20s and in, into the 1930s, you're really talking about a program that was only aimed towards a, a audience of women. Um, and so you get that separation between what's happening with girls and what's happening with women in, in the 1920s, but they're you know, both of those programs are part of cooperative, ex or what is cooperative extension today. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Oop. Well, uh, <laughs> this slide, I just wanted to say what Virginia said already is uh, many of the documents, uh, we've digitized um, many of the documents in our collection. We sort, you know, we hold, you know, part of the archives of North Carolina Cooperative Extension, and we've partnered, um, Virginia told you about our partnership with the State Archives of North Carolina, in which we digitize the, the Tomato Club booklets. Uh, we've also partnered with the Blueford Library at A&T. Um, uh, we've worked with Netta and her colleagues on um, digitizing some of their um, extension documents too. And that's, I will really stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Todd. There's we we said we could just talk about this all day long. It's hard to fit everything into an hour, but thank you so much for that wonderful history. Um, so now I'm going to uh, pass it to Netta Cox from North Carolina A and T State University. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Netta Cox. I am the head of Serials and Government Documents at Epti Bluefoot Library, and I'm also the Agricultural Liaison for the Agribusiness, Applied Economics, and Agroscience Education Programs at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, which is a historically Black university located in Greensboro, North Carolina. My presentation today is on Cooperative Extension, John D. Ray, and who was the first Black African American youth agent for the state of North Carolina and as well as Uncle Sam's Saturday Service League, which was a food program, which helped feed American citizens during World War I. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Cooperative Extension Program was officially established in 1914, as, as Todd said, through the smith Lever Act by the federal government. Uh, the federal government formed partnerships with land-grant universities and colleges to fund agricultural extension work. Uh, the Cooperative Extension Program, with the help of our land-grant universities and colleges, they support our citizens, farms, agribusinesses, communities, and youth programs through applied research, knowledge, and education. Next slide, please. One of our early pioneers in the Cooperative Extension Program was John D. Ray. He was born in Roxborough, North Carolina in December 10, 1885. Uh, he was a, a graduate of North Carolina a and State University. At that time, the university was called the Agricultural and Mechanical College for the Colored Race. Uh, once he graduated from NC a and he went on to work at Tuskegee Institute as a first farm superintendent in the areas of nature study and gardening for rural schools in the school located in Alabama, now called Tuskegee University. And then he returned to Greensboro in 1912 to work at his alma mater and became the superintendent of the college farm, which he also served as a professor. Next slide, please. Uh, these are letters of recommendation, uh, which they show the 
high character and work ethics of Mr. Ray. As you can see, one of the letters came from Booker T. Washington, who was the principal of the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. You can see the date is 1912. And um, from the previous slide, uh, he was hired at North Carolina a and as a superintendent of the farm in 1912. So I'm sure our president at the time, James B. Dudley, uh, at a and probably received these letters of recommendation on behalf of uh, Mr. Ray. Next slide, please. Also, we have these letters in our special collections at a and and also they should be also in the uh, Better Living Collection at NC State. Uh, Mr. Ray in 1915 was appointed by B.W. Kilgore, who was the director of North Carolina Agricultural Extension Service. Uh, Mr. Ray was also the first African-American Farm Makers Club agent, also later called 4-H Club. Uh, as uh, Todd said, his office was based at NC a &T. At that time, uh, there were Jim Crow laws and so they could not have their offices in Raleigh. So they based um, most of the agents, the black agents at NC a &T. and um, there they, they did a great job. They went all over the state uh, helping those who needed assistance with farming uh, rituals as well as um, technology and research in growing the, the different objects there. Uh, Ray was also in charge of uh, corn club, the pigs, crop rotation, peanuts, potatoes, and cotton. Uh, the clubs, as uh, Todd said, were initially for boys, but eventually girls were able to join the clubs. Uh, this is a second annual report of a North Carolina Extension that I um, borrowed from NC State, and you will see here in the, age, uh, the year 1916, uh, this is a report from uh, John D. Ray, his statistical report shows how many miles he traveled over 10,000 miles by rail and team, how many farms he went and visited over 400, uh, the number of meetings over 100, uh, as well as letters he wrote to get people involved in the clubs over 1,000 and uh, circulatory letters he mailed out over 28, postcards over 1,000, bulletins mailed over 1,000, and total attendance of the meetings over 34,000 people. So he was very busy. He was very active. He is known as I said before, as one of the pioneers in the state of North Carolina as far as youth agents are concerned. Next slide, please. Uh, this is talking about the cooperative extension and world war and the food programs that were uh, present at that time. During World War I, because the soldiers went off, there weren't enough people to grow food, so there were severe food shortages. So um, America needed the food demand along with the needs to send food to the European allies. So food production was needed in the United States. So what were we going to do with the labor shortages? So the extension services helped in the time of war, wartime needs. So corporate extension services collaborated, as, as uh, Todd stated before, with USDA and the extension agents and demonstration workers to encourage farm production, marketing, and conserving of perishable products by canning, drying, and preserving food. And you can see to the left, these are the poster, uh, some people call it propaganda, but these are the po posters that United States created to encourage people to help produce food in one way or the other through food production, gardening, or through canning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, African Americans wanted to show that they were patriotic as well as um, American. So they formed the Uncle Sam Service League, which was initially thought of by Tuskegee Institute. And the slogan was, win the war by working six days a week. You had to agree to sign a pledge card to work either all day Saturday or a half day Saturday. And this was for uh, African Americans who were part of corporate extension uh, clubs. So volunteers could either earn a badge or certificate depending on the number of Saturdays they worked. 
uh, Professor Ray in 1918 convinced over nearly, nearly 5,000 African American uh, kids as well as parents to pledge to work Saturday afternoons uh, until the war was over. And his quote was, in view of the great food problem facing the country, the little patriots have continued their work and are soliciting new members and sending me their names daily. To enroll in the uh, Uncle Sam Service League, you had to be a person above the age of 10 years. Next slide, please. In Uncle Sam's Service League, uh, the production was astronomical. As you can see here, uh, they produced over 17,000 chickens, over 30,000 eggs, uh, 20,000 pounds of pork, 700 bushels of wheat, 500 bushels of peas, 1,800 bushels of peanuts, 32 bales of cotton, 45,000 bushels of corn, and 700 bushels of potatoes. Next slide, please. So um, this is a picture on my, um, the, the last page here of uh, John D. Ray's granddaughter. Uh, her name is Thelma Green. She is the one who donated uh, his collection to NCANT. Uh, the, some of the pictures that you've seen, as well as his ANT 1909 um, college degree, which I, I did not include it here, but it does um, stay on it, um, College of the Colored Race. So he grew up in a time where it was uh, segregation but um, with the help of education, he was able to uh, make a good living and also give back to his race. So some of these uh, pictures and documents that I, I have in this collection and presentation are at A&T and as well as I said, I said at the Better Living Grant at NC, A uh, excuse me, NC State. So um, that's it and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Netta. Um, I really appreciate all the work you put into sharing this really important part of our history. Um, and I apologize folks for the annotations that showed up during Netta's remarks. I think this was just a, an error on a, a part of the tech setup here, but um, if you can ignore the, the yellow marks that just showed up, we're just gonna keep moving. Um, so next we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Jim Clark from uh, NC State University. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Oh, you're still muted, Dr. Clark. Let me um, see if I can unmute you. Let's see, you're still muted there. I grew up in North Carolina and came to NC State University where I spent my entire career. And a marvelous part of that career was spent in researching and writing and publishing 4-H history. I had attended college in Chapel Hill and then at Duke. And I went to Chapel Hill on a national 4-H scholarship, which I had won through outstanding project work as a kid on a tobacco farm in Warren County. As Todd was saying, it was in 1926, 27, 28, 29, when 4-H became a kind of umbrella term for the cl various clubs that had been in formation since eight, 1909, 10, 11, 12, when Ms. McKimmon and other people began to do their marvelous work in North Carolina. Today, the symbol of the four-leaf clover with 4-H's head, heart, hands, and health does not mean good luck as it would for the uninitiated, but for people who grew up in 4-H, it has to do with the importance of learning by doing to make the best better. And that kind of language is second nature for people who had the experience of 4-H in this state and around the world. It was in Ms. McKimmon's genius for marketing club 
products such as tomatoes that 4-H was first popularized as a name, but it would be a decade and a half or more before it would ever be the umbrella term for the club movement. Next slide, please. The club movement moved quickly around the world after the Second World War. The United Nations had been formed soon after the end of the war. And in 1949, the state 4-H leader in North Carolina was selected to go to Austria to see if the club movement as experienced here could thrive in Europe. And Mr. L. R. Harrell, that person spent about 60 days in Austria and returned here to North Carolina around Thanksgiving of 1949, when the outstanding 4-H's across this state were going to National 4-H Congress in Chicago, where they were decorated as some of the most outstanding boys and girls in club work throughout the whole country. The year before, 1948, saw the first international farm youth exchange program take place. And one of the representative people who exchanged was from Western North Carolina, a woman named Carolyn Smith Ivy, who is still alive today and lives in Guilford County. So you can see from the green portions of this map that the movement has spread. And in most parts of the world, 4-H or a translation of those terms would be common knowledge among people who are young and active, whether urban or rural. Next slide, please. You think of 4-H by the numbers. We've come internationally to have an involvement of about 7 million people with exchange programs. I looked yesterday on the National 4-H Council website and there are eight or nine different affiliations that 4-H's in North Carolina and elsewhere could make in order to be a part of an exchange, either to go or to host youth who come to this country. And again, whether they come from urban or rural places is no longer a distinction. In fact, the term International Farm Youth Exchange Program was changed so that farm youth would be more generalized than it had been in the 40s and 50s when the program first started. In North Carolina today, as in most of the last decade, there are over 260,000 4-Hers. They don't all belong to a club. They may be members at large. And so you refer today as 4-H youth development rather than the 4-H club to be sure that the umbrella is as big as it really is. The secret of this growth in 4-H and sustaining its history has been adult volunteers, many of whom are former 4-H boys and girls themselves. But they have been selected and trained by agents who work in the 100 counties. And these volunteer leaders work with the boys and girls at all levels including some very young boys and girls called clover buds in some places. And these adult leaders travel with these people. And during the pandemic, they have innovated through Zoom and other things that we all know about to be sure that the active life of 4-H's in North Carolina would continue. By 1939, before the Second World War, 4-H was already officially established with staff for youth development in all of the counties, 100 in all across North Carolina. Today, these programs survive and the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians would also have a program that uh, is settled in Western North Carolina. You can see by the numbers that 4-H since it took the name in the late 1920s has become very, very, very internationally powerful. Next slide, please. 
I like this division of the house according to emphasis on life skills. And the positive aspect of youth development is to give boys and girls after school or whenever they're collected together or working individually with an adult, a sense of being safe and secure. They all have structured programs, which would mean that the curriculum of 4-H is vetted by science. And unlike many other youth programs across the state and the nation, the university faculty or group of trained extension specialists would develop the curriculum and be sure that the aspects of the program stand scientific rigorous tests. The caring adult mentors are always well trained. It leads us to believe whether we're talking about 4-H boys and girls or students in the classroom that outstanding professional development of teachers or 4-H volunteers is the greatest investment we can make in the quality of our youth today. And in the next part of the four-part division, you see an emphasis on opportunities to thrive. And I want to emphasize that in 4-H traditionally, awards have been made in the form of scholarship for further study, not a car or a tractor or a watch necessarily, though sometimes these items would be given to outstanding boys and girls, but the scholarship awarded to outstanding boys and girls would mean an opportunity to study. And something that you can easily remember was said by one of the early founders of 4-H, and he put it in a way that I, as a retired educator, still like very much. He said that education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. I think that kind of uh, declaration has sustained 4-H from the 1930s through now. Next slide, please. This is just a page of positive youth development. In terms of tomato clubs or the early corn clubs, but let's say tomato clubs, you would want to find a word like gardening or horticulture among the life skills, healthy living, safe environments, agriculture, hands-on, the emphasis upon learning by doing, the admission that trial and error are an important part of our resiliency as a community. Today, we have very young people excelling in robotics through computer science and other innovations in communication, high tech, high confidence, high community values, all of these things come together to make 4-H, where life skill is important, a truly powerful effort. If we think of compassion, if we think of safe environments, we know that the sense of community that grows out of club life with a sense of thriving and instilling self-confidence can make the 4-H movement a national contribution to security, to welfare, and to well-meaning. I don't think the camping emphasis that 4-H instilled in its young people early on can be overemphasized or they took seriously the thought that recreation is the stimulus for boys and girls who would otherwise be caught in lives of endless hard labor on the farms of North Carolina from the First World War through the 1960s and 70s. So camping has always been 
the life skill, whether we're talking about swimming, crafts, nature, forestry management, all of these things come about with an emphasis on you cannot develop quality youth if all they think of is hard work. Next slide, please. Jim, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up pretty um, in just a minute if you don't mind. And the success in finding satisfaction and giving a little more than you take is the end of the slides that Dr. Yoder prepared for me to present to you and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. I really appreciate your willingness to speak to us, especially on last minute notice and to give that really powerful outline of the legacy that these tomato club booklets are a part of. So I will now move on to our final speaker, Elizabeth Englehart. Um, and this will be a little bit of a conversation, Elizabeth. Um, I really just wanted you to tell us a little bit about how you first learned about the tomato clubs and these booklets and what sort of became significant about their stories for you. Thanks, Virginia. I'm, I'm so happy to get to do that. And those of you who are staying for the Transcribathon, I'm so excited about the experience you're about to have because you are going to open up, turn the page and see these reports. And so that was my experience too. I was living in Texas. I was working on an academic project about Southern food and Southern gender. And I was looking for each chapter for a food item or a recipe or a practice that could just be the central focus of the chapter. And I read an academic article about the Mississippi Girls Tomato Clubs. So I got in my car and I went to Starkville, Mississippi and I looked in their archives and I learned there just the basics of what a tomato club is. So, you know, you had to, if you were gonna participate in a tomato club, you had to be somewhere between age eight and age 18. Well, fuzziness around the edges. You had to plant more tomatoes than you yourself or your family could use. You had to work with your club to can your harvest safely, uh, productively, efficiently. And then you had to figure out what you were going to do with all those cans of tomatoes. You had to find buyers. You had to figure out where you were going with them. So that was interesting. And then I, then I figured out that one of the earliest organizers of the tomato club movements uh, was from South Carolina. So I drove from Mississippi on to South Carolina and I found myself in the archives at University of South Carolina. And there I, I saw the, the scrapbook and the notebook of one of the organizers, Marie Cromer. And I read there that she had in mind that you had to do one more step if you were in a tomato club. And that is you had to write a report at the end of the season. And I pulled what her description of what the report should be. And some of you, when you open up your report, this is what you're gonna find. You had to make a cover design, which will in a neat and attractive manner, indicate just what can be found within the book. So you see Sally Davis's example here. Uh, she suggested you might use watercolor paints if possible. I think Sally has probably done that. You have to bind the book at the top with a red or green satin baby ribbon or card. She's got her ribbon there. And whenever possible, illustrate your story as you proceed. And so she suggested you might do that by talking about the life history of the tomato, uh, the history of your girls club. So who is your group and how do you come together? Uh, you might write about the object of a girls tomato club. You might write about why you were enrolled. And then as a bonus, if you wanted to tell your favorite tomato facts, or if you wanted to give advice, anything that would help a tomato grower, you should write your report. But in South Carolina, they didn't have any of the reports. So at that point, this still sounded kind of, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if girls actually did it. Did they fight it? Were they interested? Did they um, just do the basics? Did they follow a template? What did they do? And so then I drove the rest of the way to my home state of North Carolina and I walked in the doors of the Division of Archives and I didn't know what I was going to find. And at that time they weren't digitized so I got these big boxes, I brought them to my desk, I started opening up uh, each of the boxes and I started to encounter these reports. Do you remember the first time you saw one, Virginia? Did you have that experience? 
Yeah, I think I, I first saw them on the digital collection site and was just really taken by the, the personal handmade quality of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, so then I thought, well, what, what really is happening here? What's important about this collection? And I just flag a couple of things for everyone. One is that our, our archives in the United States are fractured. Uh, we certainly haven't done a good job collecting materials from people who were not white. Our archives are not great. We don't have a lot of Girls Tomato Club reports from non-white girls who participated in the clubs. Um, we have some materials from teenage girls, but not a lot. They, they, they weren't necessarily people who went on to have what mainstream society design, you know, designated as big public lives. They were sometimes filed away uh, in someone else's collection, so we don't quite sure, not quite sure we know it. Um, archivists like Virginia, like, like Todd, folks who are really like Netta working in our archives are, are excavating that and rewriting our finding aids so we know it's there. But we don't often have a collection that is a multitude of girls having a similar experience and then writing about it in their own way and telling their own story. And I think that's what's so fabulous about the Tomato Club reports. So Virginia, if you could show the next slide. Um, some of the, some of the, these are two of the, two of the reports that I like a lot. And I know they're a little bit hard to read. Um, but the girls themselves start to tell stories about what's important to them. Uh, their advice to the club, to the next growers or their sense of why a tomato club matters. I'm not sure I, what I thought would be in this collection, but I was so fascinated to find that some of the girls, the girl on the right, which is the handwritten piece, I know that's hard to read, so don't you know squint too much, but that's a girl named Charlotte Yoder. She was in uh, Hickory, North Carolina. And she talks about how she didn't think she wanted to join a tomato club. She wasn't, she wasn't, she had a lot of responsibility for taking care of her brother. She knew her mom was working too hard. This seemed like just time she didn't have. And it was her brother who said, you know, you might, you might give this a go. And you see, as Charlotte tells her story, she starts to realize, oh, wait a minute, this, I, I could, I could get a checkbook. I could, I could open a bank account. I could use that to try and get one of those scholarships that Jim just talked about. I, I could think about the tomato club as contributing to my family, but by something that I do, something that I own, something that I'm working with my friends to do. The girls like uh, Sally Jones, that's her report on the other side of the screen there, that's the cover of her report. Um, Sally is clearly a scientist. She's one of my favorite girls in the entire collection. This is the picture of the canner that she used. So Sally was young enough or early enough in the history of the, of the tomato clubs that she was using. Uh, she was canning in tin. She was canning in metal, not in glass. And so this was a fairly technical piece of equipment that she had to learn how to use. And in her report, she, she, she goes in on advice to future growers, but she's really focusing on precisely how long the cans need to stay in, in one direction before you turn them in another direction. She thinks about the precise temperature. She talks about using that piece of equipment. And then she says at the end, you know, I might want to run a factory someday. So she's thinking about what kind of, what kind of skill can I get that would let me live the kind of modern, uh, forward thinking, um, interesting life that she wants to live. Um, Virginia, can I tell one more of my, my favorite yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This one is much less serious. Some of the girls uh, maybe don't take it quite as seriously as their organizer wanted them to. And one of my favorites is a girl named Ethel Baggett. And um, Ethel, I, I can even read you a little bit of her report. She has two reports in the collection. One is the official one. And I, it's I suspect whoever, whoever transcribes it, I would love to know what you think. I think she had to go back and do the official one after she did her first one and got in a little bit of trouble for it. Because in her first one, she uh, talks about uh, they're in the middle of canning and all of the girls in, in her club. And 
uh, one of the one of the uh, pieces of equipment turns over. No one's hurt, but they're turned over, and she gets wet. Her her stockings get wet, and she says, "How I squalled! I had to take off my hose and let them dry, so I was barefooted." And the girls all said they wished some young man would come along, and sure enough, he did. But he didn't see my feet. And she's, she is telling her, she's using her slang, she's telling her story, she's writing what's important about the Tomato Club for her. Uh, and so I, I found myself in the archive and I found myself listening to these girls and I found myself imagining what their lives were. They are telling me what's important to them. Some of them are using their Tomato Club profits um, to open that checking account. Some are like Margaret Brown is going straight to the dean of the college she wants to attend and saying, I will trade you tomatoes for your kitchen in, for my tuition. I don't have cash to pay you, but I've got tomatoes. Is it a deal? And she makes that deal. She gets to go to college. So I, like I said, I'm just so thrilled. You're going to open these up. You're going to see what you find. You're going to see where you can can make a connection between today and that girl who put her pen to paper, put her pencil to paper, put her watercolors to paper, and told you the story of her tomato clubs. But I know we are, you are about to turn the page and do that, but I want to I just tell you one more story, which I think is two slides ahead. So um, if you can do that for us, Virginia. Nope, one slide. OK, there. I told you I, can't, I learned about the tomato clubs in a very academic manner. And I made my way through these archives. And then I found myself looking at this picture. This is a picture of the Girls Tomato Club from Quebec, North Carolina. That is the porch of my great great grandmother's general store. I had no idea. These, these are, this is my family. These are relatives of mine. I can't identify them all, but my mother can. I'll have to call her in the next time we come together. But I didn't know. Tomato clubs are so woven into the fabric of North Carolina that they're all over. And so that's my family tomato club. And maybe, just maybe, someone will have that experience today too. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, I couldn't be more excited to have all four of you here to speak today, but um, especially to, to get, hopefully, those of us in the audience who are going to stay to transcribe um, to see a little taste of what's to come um, is really wonderful. And just how important it is that these materials are made really accessible and discoverable for people by transcribing them, I think is a great, great um, next step. So I, um, uh, we don't have time for questions, but I do encourage everyone who's attending today to visit the link on the screen here. Again, go.ncsu.edu slash nc-state-transcribes. Um, you can contact me. My email address is on the very first page there. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters, I will be happy to share those with them. Um, and we can continue the conversation on email or perhaps some, some more Zoom, personal Zoom conversations. Um, so I just want to thank everyone again so much for being here, um, all of our speakers and our audience members. Um, I am, we're going to take a short break now. And if you want to continue on for the Transcribathon, you can just stay hanging out on Zoom here. Um, you can take a break and come back later if you want to um, when it works for you. Uh, or if you're, you're good for the day, then thank you for being here. Um, again, you can transcribe at any point in the future. Just go to the link here and follow the steps and um, have fun and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks again, everyone. Um, I'm going to mute myself for a couple minutes and we'll be back in about five with um, our next wonderful group of NC State uh, colleagues of mine. Take care, everybody.